it's always uh, exciting to come back to Aspen and to connect with friends and, and to kind of get up to date on what's current. And so many of these conversations are happening in the present, uh, you know, changing on a daily basis. And this one in particular, um, you know, we're excited to begin, but I think it is really the beginning of a conversation that we'll be having for many years. Um, I'm so honored to be next to uh, and learn from Sarah and become a friend of Sarah's over the last year and a half or so and, and learn about her work. And I know she's gonna, she, she's gonna begin this conversation um, and I think we can probably start with um, what Damien mentioned, which was um, the Vision and Justice um, publication. Uh, Aperture Magazine, magazine, for those of you who don't know, you know well-known magazine, cataloging uh, important changes in, in photography. And um, she was asked to guest edit Aperture Magazine in the summer of 2006 and 16. And, um, since editing uh, that magazine, it's become the most popular and most sold Aperture magazine ever, which is incredible. Also then winning the uh, very, very prestigious Infinity Award uh, because of it. This is a profound, um, uh, let's say, contribution to the world of, of photography. And, and I think the first question would be why, why has it hit such a chord? Uh, in the public's imagination, and why is it that you think, Sarah, that it's been so profoundly successful? I, I should just uh, first just acknowledge, I think, how, my, how grateful I am to be able to speak about this topic here at Aspen. Thank you to Damien Wetzel for the invitation. Thank you so much. He's such a comrade for me with this work. I want to thank all those, really, who put this incredible event together. Um, there are many new friends and, and old and many colleagues in the room from whom I learn a great deal about this topic. Uh, but I, I couldn't have imagined that I would be here speaking with Michael Murphy about it uh, until Damien had the vision to, to bring us together. So it's meaningful and I hope to learn from you with our, the Q&A that we'll have at the end of, of our time. So the vision and justice issue of, of Aperture does constitute a kind of framework for the work that I do as an educator and as a curator and as an author. But just to, to give you a sense of how I arrived at this work, and this work being asking myself this question, how has culture, how has art constituted a measure of human life? I want to tell you a quick story. So when I was young, I, I arrived at this question by learning from a man whose initials I share. I'm Sarah Elizabeth Lewis. His name is Shadrach Emanuel Lee. A much cooler name than mine, <laughs> my grandfather. He was, in 1926, he went to school in New York City in high school and public school. In the 11th grade, I learned from him that he asked a question of his teacher. He wanted to know why, in his history books, the world didn't look like the world that he knew. He wanted to know where Asian Americans were, African Americans were, Native Americans were. And the answer that his teacher gave him which was that those groups not present in the history books did nothing to merit inclusion, didn't sit well with him, and he refused to accept that as an answer. This is 1926. He was expelled for his impertinence. He had a sense of you know, his pride being so wounded that he never went back to high school. But he became an artist, a jazz musician, playing back up with Count Basing, Duke Ellington over time. And he passed away when I was in college. I went to Harvard for college, too. And I wondered if there was something about his story that could allow me to investigate the contributory function of the arts for citizenship. I would think about the paintings that he created. And he ultimately created works that represented what he wanted to find in those history books, the world that looked like the world. So it gave me a, a sense that we hadn't quite interrogated the function of culture for citizenship and for justice. And that's what began my journey. And I'm mindful that two generations later, I'm here at, you know, at Harvard teaching the very topics that he was expelled for asking about, which says a great deal about the potential of our country, despite the current political climate we might find ourselves in today. So there, there's that. So in the summer of, well, nine months before the summer of 2016, I was asked to guest edit this issue. And the issue is meant to effectively serve as a corrective for the narratives about race and citizenship in, in the United States. 
It aggregates a range of photographers, poets, scholars, writers from some who've spoken here, like Henry Louis Gates Jr. and um, Claudia Rankin and Margot Jefferson, great photographers and Carrie Mae Weems, Deborah Willis, the play Lee Frazier and others, um, to present what we know to be true about specifically African-American life that's not often presented in the media. And this, this issue did have this unusual um, impact in the sort of public arena at large beyond the field of photography. It sold out 20,000 copies in seven weeks when it came out, and it did a second print run shortly thereafter, and it was covered three times by the New York Times, just crazy sort of things like that. And I have asked myself that question, why? Why would an issue do this? Why would it become required reading at NYU for all incoming freshmen? What, what did it offer? And I think it offered us a, a mindful or an urgent example of the role that culture plays in correcting our narratives that we have about the so-called other. But what um, I think what I would like to do to illustrate for you precisely how that works is just play for you a clip and then show maybe a few images afterwards. This is a, a clip that I use in the classroom to effectively ask my students the same question. Why, how do images have persuasive efficacy today? What, how do they serve as a civic um, object for us? And uh, we had an occasion to think this through by creating a multimedia piece, actually thanks to uh, Damien again, who was uh, commissioning a great project at the Kennedy Center and asked to see if the vision and justice issue could be animated in a way that would engage with Kennedy. Now, John F. Kennedy gave a speech that examines the same question about the role of culture for justice and citizenship. And so my students and I, we set to a, an aspect of this speech, images from the issue. So I think what I'll do is, if we can get this to play, I'll play this for you now and then uh, continue to talk. So if I just hit this, will it play? Why don't you just restart it? Activity. <laughs> just hit escape and then uh, start it again. Yeah, just go into full presenter mode and then it will probably start. All the way down to the bottom. All the way down, yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Michael. <laughs> if sometimes our great artists have been the most critical of our society, it is because their sensitivity and their concern for justice, which must motivate any true artist, makes him aware that our nation falls short of its highest potential. I see little of more importance to the future of our country and our civilization and full recognition of the place of the artist. If art is to nourish the roots of our culture, society must set the artist free to follow his vision wherever it takes him. We must never forget that art is not a form of propaganda, it is a form of truth. And as Mr. McLeish once remarked, of poets, there is nothing worse for our trade than to be in style. In free society, art is not a weapon, and it does not belong to the sphere of polemic and ideology. Artists are not engineers of the soul. It may be different elsewhere. A democratic society, in it, the highest duty of the writer, the composer, the artist, is to remain true to himself and to let the chips fall where they may. In serving his vision of the truth, the artist best serves his nation. And the nation which disdains the mission of art invites the fate of Robert Frost's hired man, the fate of having nothing to look backward to with pride and nothing to look forward to with hope. I look forward to a great future for America, a future in which our country will match its military strength with our moral restraint, its wealth with our wisdom, its power with our purpose. I look forward to an America which will not be afraid of grace and beauty, which will protect the beauty of our natural environment, 
which will preserve the great old american houses and squares and parks of our national past and which will build handsome and balanced cities for our future i look forward to an america which will reward achievement in the art as we reward achievement in business or statecraft i look forward to an america which will steadily raise the standards of artistic accomplishment and which will steadily enlarge cultural opportunities for all of our citizens and i look forward to an america which commands respect throughout the world not only for its strength but for its civilization as well and i look forward to a world which will be safe not only for democracy and diversity but also for personal distinction point to a few of these images which are throughout the Vision and Justice um, publication. And this compendium video really kind of yeah. I think shows the breadth of the narrative that you're diving into. Mm -hmm. Can you name a few that are particularly potent for this discussion? Yeah, sure. Uh, so if we don't fully acknowledge the role that culture plays for citizenship and justice, I would argue that it's oftentimes because we don't we only come to do so during times of crisis. So there are a few examples, if we can call up the other PowerPoint, I can, I can point to. If we might all recognize it or know. While we wait for that, maybe we can talk about what was at stake mm -hmm. with this project. What if we didn't do this kind of compendium? Well, you know, today, I mean, sociologists remind us that we're living in increasingly like-minded communities. We, we're living in a siloed sort of state of affairs. And so there's this feedback loop that technology reinforces, which only compounds the problem. And I think the stakes have to do with the role that media is playing for giving us a sense of the so-called other. Um, now, a few, few images, I think, dramatize the way in which we have gotten to know one another um, through culture. So I'll just give you a few kind of case studies just, just quickly, and it'll give you a sense of how I got into this work. I, I learned, for example, that Louis Armstrong had a huge role to play in the erasure of segregation in the United States. This, this is an image by Lizette Modell. I learned about this because of the story of Charles Black Jr., who, when he was young in Texas, you know, wanted to just go to this college dance and uh, meet some girls, really. But he found himself just transfixed by the power of Louis Armstrong in 1931 in that year and realized that if there was genius coming out of his horn, then segregation must be wrong. Right? He became one of the lawyers for Brown versus Board of Education, which outlawed segregation. And he became a constitutional lawyer at Columbia and Yale. And he would hold this Armstrong listening night every year for his students to honor the way in which culture had affected this inner shift, allowed him to see past his own blind spots. Right? Think about the function that the abolition of the slave ship, the broadside of the slave ship Brooks had for the abolition of slavery in parliamentary hearings. Right? It showed with graphic precision the inhumanity of the system in a way that rational argument alone couldn't. Right? It showed how you could fit the legally permitted 454 men, women, and children into the hull of the ship, even though we know that it held up to 703. Right? Think of it outside of the context of race and citizenship, the function that this earth rise, as we know it, image taken of the earth from the Apollo 8 and the 1960s had in galvanizing the environmental movement. Right? You know, I love the way that Gino Diaz sort of puts all this in, a, in effect. We all have a blind spot around our privileges shaped exactly like us. Right? And <laughs> culture often gets us to see past those blind spots. But you know, I just would conclude with the final sort of case study. I think Frederick Douglass is the person who understood this nexus of art and citizenship and justice more than anyone else. And as our, our president reminds us, he's being recognized more and more. Uh, so I should remind us he died in 1895. But he understood this, wrote a speech during the Civil War entitled Pictures and Progress, 
And that became the framework and constituted the stakes division and justice issues. I could hearken back to that moment. He, he considered what could have been a trifle for some during this nation severing conflict as in fact what could reconstitute our civic body. He understood the catalytic force that culture could have in us and inaugurated this term, thought picture, as what shifts in us. We have a new vision of the world oftentimes, as Charles Black did through Louis Armstrong, right? As those who saw the broad side of the slave ship books did. And, and Douglas was making the case that as his, that this would be a phenomenon in American political life that we would only understand maybe a century after he was gone. He was very clear that he was just touching on what we're still living out today, right? The way in which we are seeing each other through culture and learning about each other through culture. So those are a few case studies. So, um, you, just one thing to reflect on this. I mean, um, you, you've, you've called this before visual literacy. Mm -hmm. Um, are you, do you think Douglas was getting into some of this in trying to create more visual literacy mm -hmm. uh, with the country mm -hmm. by his insistence about being photographed so frequently? Yeah, that's a good point. He was the most photographed American man, not African-American man, right. American man. What did Douglas understand about the, the importance of a representative figure right. like himself, right? Someone who could offer a corrective to the denigrating stereotypes about African Americans during the day. He understood the importance of visual literacy, yes, as, as, I, as I call it, um, now. And I think that as we do live in these increasingly siloed communities, visual literacy is becoming more and more important. It's becoming a civic act. And so when I teach, for me the stakes are being mindful of the students who I have, hopefully will become curators and art historians, but most will not, and most, I think, will be more effective global citizens because they are, they are leading uh, and living through this um, heightened sense of conditioned sight. So, yeah. Well, I have a few questions for you. Can I ask you? Can, can I? Can we go back and forth? So we are having an unmoderated conversation. Michael and I speak so much about these topics. We, we thought it might be nice to let you sort of be a fly on the wall of us uh, talking about these these issues. I have a question for you that harkens back to the JFK speech. JFK here, Kennedy is making a, the case for the political function right, of the artist. You really argued in your manifesto, and, and Michael, as you know, is just this extraordinary architect whose work is so impactful. I think one of the most recent awards is the Cooper Hewitt Award, which he'll receive in October, which is a huge honor for the field. Um, along with many others that he's received. But you, you've made this case, and I think it's, you, it's a, there's a level of thought leadership embedded in, in doing so, that you've argued that there's a false dichotomy between design and ethics, which is effectively what Kennedy was saying, too. Can you tell us a, more about how you arrived at that idea? Well, thank you. Maybe I'll grab this oh, yeah. one as well. And I just, I want to, I, I appreciate you giving me credit, but I don't take credit for those uh, accolades. Um, my, Co-founders uh, Alan Ricks and I think Marika Joy Clark are also in the room. And uh, architects often, uh, without you know, without modesty, take credit for the work of entire teams uh, that are doing <laughs> enormous amounts of work. So I will not do that today. But I think um, uh, we did have this question, all of us collectively, when we were students of architecture. You know, can can there be an architectural product uh, that's also infused with with ethics, uh, or more to the point, why is there this bifurcation where there's great, what we were learning in school, what some would call capital A architecture, and then this subdiscipline of social architecture. Why was this separated? What would it be, um, what kind of processes would be necessary in us to make an architecture uh, that's both full of beauty and also full of a commitment to its environmental and social uh, responsibilities? Um, I'll just, this is a big injustice. One of the, um, the way that we began this organization, Mass Design Group, uh, was actually sort of on a lark. I mean, we were students, we were studying um, architecture, and I think there was this sort of, again, this missing discussion around the role of the architect and, and his or her responsibility and also complicity in, in the inequalities in our world. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and that happened across the board, but there was also a great dearth of work happening um, with organizations that were trying to serve communities uh, through the lens of social justice. So um, when we were a student, we met uh, just on a lecture uh, at Harvard, uh, Dr. Paul Farmer, who runs an amazing organization called Partners in Health, and social justice activist for you know, decades in his organization and providing fundamental health care to some of the world's poorest, working in Haiti originally, but then out into Malawi and Rwanda, Russia and Boston, um, many other places around the world, and, and, and he was talking about all the work that they were doing around the world, but also all the buildings that they were just building in order to serve these communities, provide crucial access to care. They also need to build hospitals. Mm -hmm. And uh, after a lecture, we asked if, you know, who was working with him on these, and who were the architects, and he said, architects, no architects have ever reached out to work with us. We have had to do this ourselves. This was amazing. Like, what was wrong with not only the imagination of what architecture's, the architect's role is in um, participating in questions of social justice, but also what's wrong with the marketplace where these opportunities aren't available. So um, that generated a conversation where we moved to work with his team in Rwanda. We developed and designed a new hospital with his team, which is featured here, um, called the Batara Hospital, which opened in 2011 when we we're just graduating from our from our um, our, um, our uh, degree program, and uh, the principles of this I think really inform the way we think about architecture around the world. Um, and I can talk a little bit about that. But I mean, the primary the primary binaries that we were wrestling with was that one the the access to beauty, the access to the beautiful, what what we had. I think defamed as only the aesthetic, mm -hmm. um, was actually a question of justice. It was a question of dignity, mm -hmm. right? That why was it that the poorest are getting the, the most poorly thought about mm -hmm. um, infrastructure? Mm -hmm. And what was it to build something that was hideous and inappropriate and um, for those just because it was cheap and inexpensive to do? Mm -hmm. Could we do the best that we could possibly do? This was a structural argument. And um, it led to work, us building an organization. We're now 75 architects working both in, around the world. We have an office in Africa and in Rwanda and, and in Boston. This is a project in, in Port-au-Prince, Haiti, after the cholera epidemic emerged. We designed a, a center to treat uh, cholera. Um, and then we've begun working on um, the role of the public monument, the public memorial, and what responsibility that has in uh, describing and pushing forward our own access to a more free society. Mm -hmm. When JFK talked about art, in, an, in, an, in a free society, art is not a weapon. Mm -hmm. and what he's suggesting is that art can be weaponized, mm -hmm. right? And that architecture can also be weaponized. And it suggests there's moments when it is weaponized mm -hmm. uh, that uh, it is cutting away for our ability to live free and fair lives, access, right? Dignity, beauty, these things are interrelated. And the architect, like it or not, is participating in these questions, in conversations of power, even if he or she is willing to acknowledge it or not. And that to us, I think, is a founding, uh, kind of a, a driving feature for the work of our organization, but also for the field of architecture to take responsibility for its complicity mm -hmm in decades of generational abuse and trauma, but also aspirational hope mm -hmm. and the delivery of beauty to communities that desperately need it. Mm -hmm. One of the aspects of your work that I find so intriguing is the, your mindfulness and intentionality uh, around the act of, of leave taking, mm -hmm. I think, how you exit a space and what you come away with. Can you tell us a bit more about how you structure this, maybe thinking about a few of your yeah, so um, thank you for that question. You know, one of the things that is so profound about working in a, in a condition like northern Rwanda, we have very little electricity and um, with partners in health and these social justice activists who are deeply engaged in the community is that you don't really have a choice but to engage in questions of uh, workforce and labor and environmental responsibility. I mean, there is no other choice. You have to engage. And that, to some degree, uh, allowed us to sort of ask that question, why was it that other architects have chosen not to engage in these questions um, in other projects. And so um, participation 
in the design and building of a building is fundamental, but also what happens? What's the transformation that happens when you go through great architecture? Who do you become afterwards? And that, um, let's say, behavior change or that phenomenological shift or that learning, what you might call visual literacy, we might call design literacy, that the kind of literacy that you emerge out of an intentionally designed place anew, right, with more, more awareness of the world around you. This is the gift of, of great architecture. And um, leave taking, you know, emerging out of this with something that you can capture, take home, remember, be transformed by, can actually be designed into the process itself. And so, just as one example, uh, this is a new uh, proposal for the National Holocaust Memorial uh, of the United Kingdom, which has, has, does not have a national memorial to commemorate the Holocaust and until now they've proposed this. And we were selected in an international competition to design it. And um, as you can see, it's adjacent to Parliament, right? It's a small patch of grass on the Thames. It could not be a more charged political space, right? And yet they want to introduce this crucial memorial there, which is also challenging politically. And we asked this question, what do you take away? And so um, instead of designing, again, a static monument, one that we reflect upon, maybe ignore, maybe we don't even recognize, what would it be to build a monument that we have to engage it in order for it to be built? And so this project is a, is a, pro is a memorial that's actually unbuilt. We decided to design uh, six million individual stones, each with the names of the, of the murdered Jews in the Holocaust. And uh, when you go, you actually are encouraged to take a stone, take a stone back to your home. You're eventually this pile of stones, this sort of enormous four-story high pile of stones diminishes to, to nothing, right? a kind of place uh, of respite and quietude in the middle of London. But the important thing is six million people have agreed to participate, right? They've agreed to engage, right? They've decided to make their even subconscious decision to take a stone and embrace a more just and tolerant society. It demands participation in order for this to be successful. It also suggests that it could be unsuccessful. It's a little bit more vulnerable as a piece of architecture. And so in that we see the potential for architects to be more deliberate, right? That our, we're always participating and engaging and taking something away from our built environment, but can we actually reveal it in physical space so that you also are knowing that you're engaging in that direction? No, no, it's fine. Well, at this point, I wonder if it might be useful to also think about how it is that we also all participate in a kind of a leave taking in terms of imagery and, and justice. Um, can you just go back a few slides? Did you want to show your video or no? Okay. Um, here we go. I don't have any green ones available. So if you go back one more. Yeah, the, one of the, the things that unites our work is, is thinking about this idea of leave taking. And lately, we are, I think, in, period in which we are saturated with images that do uh, constitute, in some cases, memorialization um, if they are virally spread images of injustice, say, right, and racial terror, for example. I just was speaking in Minnesota, and it was such a charged moment right after the acquittal of Amber Castile, right, to be speaking there. Um, of course, because there's, on the one hand, I think a, a concern that there's an inertness of pictures, right? That they don't function any longer to have persuasive efficacy. That they somehow cannot um, utter. That they can't speak. That they, that, and we, many people in this room, have probably seen the video, right, of Sonia Ember Castile's murder. And to think that that couldn't have changed the outcome is, is still it boggles the mind, right? And so, one could, you know, conclude a really cynical kind of result, which is that these images have exhausted their potency because of the, the degree to which we are living awash in them. Susan Sontag might say that, right? Her argument was that there's a state of paralysis that we're in uh, by living through too many images of violence and being inundated by them. I still go back to Douglas because I think that when we revere our artists and our architects and, and you know, your colleagues in the room, we're doing so because we know that there's 
the power of composition, the power of the work that you create can give us a sense of productive stillness to stop and to ponder anew. I have this image on the screen to give us one example of this. This is an image that Dorothea Lange was commissioned to take by the federal government during Japanese internment. So she's commissioned, she's the first photographer commissioned during the, by the War Relocation Agency in 1942. She's commissioned because of the efficacy of her images. We know her migrant mother photograph, right? We know the ways in which that actually did galvanize the United States to see uh, the citizenry, citizenry anew, but she was critical of the government's policy. So what did she do here? This image ultimately never came to light. It was impounded by the government because it was seen as too potent and too critical of the government's work. If this was a seminar, I would ask you why. <laughs> And we'd go around and discuss what we could do at now. Can anyone tell me why you think this composition was too potent and would have been censored by the government? Talk to me about tone, maybe hand placement. Anything? This seems like a normal citizen is going in with a mm. Yeah. All of a sudden, it seems to emphasize. Right, right. This big, and it reminds us that two thirds of those who were interned were, in fact, citizens of the United States. Yes. It, that, that hat all the way from the chief seen as an upright citizen is what Dorothy Lang has so as emblematized and focused our eye upon through her tight cropping skills, right? Any other aspects of the work? And just how they hand the camera in a kind of, you know, non dynamic way that they mm -hmm. use a slide to show mm -hmm. the dynamic power. Yeah. The government is sort of represented as that depersonalized entity, right? Those hands there. And uh, where's the clicker? Do I have the clicker? Oh, you do. <laughs> this is another image uh, from the same project by Dorothea Lang as well of the Shiboya family here. This family was also interned. Right? How is she presented, this family, such that it would be seen as too potent an image, right, to be released to the public? Yeah, and that template of American citizenship comes to us from Grant Wood, right? Comes to us from a painting you know, that, then Gordon, that then Gordon Parks appropriated with the image of Ella Watson that you saw earlier. And the other hand here. Yeah. I feel like it's too much mm -hmm. Such an important point. I mean, Jan Walker, who's actually giving a talk right now across the way, speaks about the function of art for justice as doing precisely that, creating uh, a bridge for empathy for us. So we, we get a sense of why the, these works, I think, are, are so potent and can leave us with something, right, that we don't have ordinarily. That there's a, a productive force to, yes, to architecture, to, to the arts. And it's, I think, why we're here, right? I, th I think that leave taking point there is a really, really important one. This notion that an image can be too potent mm -hmm. and that it might actually be counterproductive to the aim of the intention to make this photograph in the first place also reveals an entire you know, field of work mm -hmm. that has been hidden, right? Or that's been silenced or that's been omitted. Mm -hmm. I might use this opportunity to, to, to talk about um, some other omissions that you've recently published about. Um, so, Sarah, I'm going to zip through some. Sarah uh, published uh, an op-ed in the New York Times this Sunday, which is incredible, and I recommend it. Everybody check it out on the history of um, the unknown history of the Confederate flag. And uh, here, I'm mean, I'll have you speak about it, but here are three images of proposed flags from from your research that you encountered. Could you tell us a little bit about that work and also why this was omitted and why we aren't talking about these, but are only talking about you know, stars and bars? So, as I mentioned earlier, this work, the framework is entirely to look at art and citizenship and justice. And in my first, actually, week of being a professor at Harvard, I, I learned that, in, in part, it's inspired by Brian Stevenson's framework, um, 
I learned that my uncle had sort of executed this act of radical empathy. He had African American man, he had become one of the sons of Confederate veterans. And I was shocked that he had. He lives in Virginia, he's a minister, runs a funeral home, he's six foot eight, he can tell a story like you wouldn't believe, he's an amazing man. And I can imagine him being a rabble rouser in these meetings. The reason why he joined is because our ancestor, as it turned out, was, um, well, the plaque says he was a servant, but we know he was a slave for the Confederate Army. He served as a cook and a ferry guide. So he legitimately could be part. And uh, so I went to the Museum of the Confederacy, and it, trying to take my uncle's model as an example. I wondered what I could find in the archives um, if I just let myself be proximate to it. And I, I made a, a discovery that, you know, a kind that the scholar really dreams of making, actually. And it took me two years to decide to publish it and just did before coming here. So I found that there was a, um, really the question I had was, is the Confederate flag the one that they really wanted to endure? It seemed, as an art historian, it seems that the Confederate flag was somehow too oblique. It didn't actually deliberately state their beliefs in slavery and white supremacy, and I wanted to know if there's more to the story, and I found out that yes, there is. We just had never told it. So during the Civil War, the Confederate Congress was at work trying to find a flag that would emblematize their belief in white supremacy in advance, yeah. And this, there's a compendium that I found in the archives, it's about 450 pages, that delineates all of the different models they tried out to affect this result. This is a flag that was hanging in the newspaper office of the Charleston Mercury. This is all in the Times article in 1862. Um, that, that states this, and uh, the flag designer stated this about it. I'll just read it to you. Those who imagine, well, it actually begins a bit differently. So this is a black and white flag. The designer says, it's a flag of peculiar dignity and simplicity. It is altogether unlike the ensign of any other nation, and those who imagine that a flag should be symbolical will find in the colors of this one, white and black, an obvious significance. Such a standard would typify our belief in the peculiar institution and be an enduring mark of our resolve to retain that institution while we exist as an independent people. Why do we not know about these flags? The other ones that were on the other slide uh, were identical in their, in their function. This one on, the, on your right was meant to be a graphic display of the, South, the Confederate South's belief in racial hierarchy. So white, red, and black was meant to symbolize white, black, the Native Americans. This uh, set of stars was, was meant to as the designer put it, just uh, typify their sense of white control right, as the dominant force that they were fighting for. These flags have not come to light. Right. And in the end, what I found in the archive, what I found in looking at the citizens writing in about their, their love of these flags was that they realized that they couldn't put them out on the global stage <laughs> and have a sense of pride about their political policies and beliefs. It would have been an international PR kind of nightmare, right? It's like an impossible task. It's an impossible task to reconcile their belief in white freedom and black bondage. There's not one image that could, that could actually state that, right, from afar. And so you see, if you look at the, those years, 1861 through 65, a concession. These flags wouldn't work, but the flag that soldiers had died under would be a way to memorialize and to honor the Confederacy. So this is how we've arrived at the Confederate flag. I think as an art historian, it, it took me taking symbols seriously, right, to, to wrestle with the archive, to, to think that there could be more to say there. So this is um, ongoing work, in part because each of these flag designers is a significant figure. And telling their stories, I think, will be important. It's also a reminder that as we're wrestling with these current debates about Confederate monuments and we'll talk more about that, uh, we're still living in the legacy of this work. We, if there's a reason why we can't state precisely what the monuments mean or what the flag means, it's because there was a deliberate act of cloaking at work in the process. And I think it speaks to the important function of, of art and politics today. I think I'd like to go through that 
term itself mm -hmm. with cloaking. Mm -hmm. I mean, what does it mean that these flags, which directly we're trying to deal with, white supremacy, mm -hmm. um, and wrestle with it visually through a through a, through an image, through a design mm -hmm. you know, artifact, mm -hmm. um, they couldn't they couldn't wrestle with that. They couldn't mm -hmm. keep cool in that. So they went mm -hmm. with something that was less less overt, right? Yeah. Um, something that to some degree cloaked the intentionality behind the creation mm -hmm. of a new space mm -hmm. based on the principles of white supremacy. Yeah. How does that emerge? How does this cloaking also mm -hmm. find itself in the, in the kind of narrative of, um, so the continued narrative of, of art and justice over the course of the last century or so? Well, you know, in fact, I think the answer might, might take us back to some of the research that you've done in being in Montgomery recently. Um, one of the one of the points that our mayor, Mitch Landrieu, makes, or you can go back, I think. Sorry, just so that you're aware, this is Raphael Thion, who's the um, chief clerk of the US Army that created this compendium of all these flags. He spent 50 years documenting this process. Um, he was a Union soldier from New York City, which is in part why the Times, Times published it. So how does this cloaking function today? Well. In part, it functions through the undated aspect of the Confederate monuments, the, the way in which we are, we are cloaking over the rationale for having them in the first place, mm -hmm. which makes it all the more difficult to, to dislodge them. Right. The, if you don't know that their date coincides precisely with the, lost the kind of burgeoning lost cause narrative, the sense of a deliberate pride right, in, in a Confederate history, the nostalgia, uh, then it's harder uh, to, to state precisely what you are forcing some to let go of. Right. Can you tell us a bit about the Confederate monuments that you or that you've learned about by doing work with EJI in Montgomery? Yeah, sure. I, so some of the, a recent project that we're working on with um, the Equal Justice Initiative is the, um, is the National Memorial for Peace and Justice, which commemorates and recognizes the over 4,000 African Americans who were lynched in America. Um, because Brian and EJI representatives aren't here, I won't speak to um, I won't speak to it directly. But I can speak to some of the efforts that we made as designers to try to wrestle with this in our decisions as architects. And um, you know, the first sort of real awakening moment is not unlike Mitch Landrau's um, op-ed, which about the removal of the Confederate mm -hmm. monuments in, in New Orleans, you know, um, what does it take for us to be aware of, 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 these, um, of these monuments? What does it take for us to be aware of our built environment? Mm -hmm. Mitch talks about in his op-ed, mm -hmm. walking around New Orleans his entire life, and then only, as is Wynton Marsalis pointed out, the, the Robert E. Lee statue, and saying, you know, why is that there? Mm -hmm. And him being kind of awakened to the idea that this was an act of um, intentional violence, an intentional act of white supremacy to place these monuments at a certain time within the city that didn't speak to the entire history of New Orleans, of course, or to our nation. Um, you don't notice it originally, right? It's a sort of bystander issue. The kind of the banality of the memorial without its date um, fades into the background. So when you walk around Montgomery, um, which is a city that's been kind of uh, the core of it has been ripped out of it, and very few people even walking around the city. So there's all sorts of reasons for that um, we can go into. But you start to notice that there are monuments sort of everywhere, There's plaques commemorating it. Jefferson Davis went to a tea party in this house. I mean, like the most banal plaques that you can imagine. And at first, you sort of say, well, why is that? You know, you don't put it all together. Um, it wasn't until we as an organization tried to actually map these, you know, mm -hmm. pull up as architects do, into a kind of 10,000 foot perspective and say, well, let's count them all. It turns out that there's more markers in Montgomery than any other city in America next to Philadelphia. Right? It doesn't compare in terms of size, it doesn't compare in any of any kind of metric why Philadelphia would have more markers, mm -hmm. um, only Philadelphia, even more than Boston, mm -hmm. um, some of these historic, overly nostalgic cities, right? Mm -hmm. and, um, and then you start to count how many of them are for the Confederacy. And you realize it's, an, it's a deliberate act of dilution, right? It's a rewriting, a cloaking of a history for a specific period of time to tell the narrative of this, of this city and played out through the public sphere, right? Played out through the public space, through architecture, through marking, through plaques, through monument making, mm -hmm. 
Um, this is an act that designers are participating in and are complicit in not asking why these are, these are here and what we should do about them. And so that kind of revelation made it more and more obvious that we as architects have been complicit in the kind of hierarchies and power relationships that our built environments continually are speaking and symbolizing back to the communities mm -hmm. uh, that they are subjugating and also some who they are trying to liberate. You know, this, before we open to questions, I think we might have, I don't know how we are doing on time, but don't give us an indication. Okay. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, here, you know, the issue to do with S speed, I think is really mm -hmm. crucial to discuss. I mean, one of the uh, contributions as I see it that, that you and your, your colleagues, Alan Rex and, and others make as architects is to get us to pause. You know, we're in a moment in time in which speed governs how it is that we work <laughs> because of technology and we're very grateful for that. On, on the, one, on the one hand, on the other, I think it can prevent aspects of civic discourse that have been hallmarks of our society for so long. I think we're still working through how to, to, to work without um, the deliberation that can come with kind of productive slowness. In, in, my, in my work, for example, I, I think about the, in terms of memorialization, the function that the recently erected plaque in, at, on Harvard's campus has in Lisper Garden. There's a plaque that now commemorates the, there are probably many others, but four slaves who worked for two Harvard presidents in front of Wadsworth House. So the uh, Tichuba, Juba, Venus, and, and Juba. And it was inaugurated by President Drew Faust and John Lewis as a way to commemorate their labor and their contribution to the community. But that plaque is meant to arrest you, right, to stop you in your, your track. And maybe it's just me being too meta about it, too conceptual, but when I do stop, I realize that that, in fact, that act of, of pausing, that kind of immersive concentration that we're so missing today is one of, is the contributory function of culture, mm -hmm. right, of architecture, memorialization, and of great works of art that do precisely that. And it's perhaps what it animated Douglas to rewrite that speech three different times, right, to, to think about what that mechanism is like. So this, this idea of speed, I think, is something we still haven't theorized, researched enough, worked through, but I do believe it's, it's urgent to do so because we are, I mean, we make as many images today in two minutes as were produced in the entire 19th century. Mm -hmm. I mean, we are, this image saturation issue is, is real and I think it, it's, in my mind, pointing me more towards the built environment, more, more towards the moralization. Yeah, I 100% I, I agree with you. And I, you know, one of the things that we've been wrestling with and also trying to theorize is this, is this conceptualization of slowness in architecture. We, um, we're trying to create an allegory and, uh, about what it would be compared to, maybe the slow food movement but of, of architecture. What does it take for us to slow down and understand um, every decision that goes into the process of making our built world and take it very seriously. The speed and efficiency arguments and uh, of, of making buildings very, very quick and fast, um, what they cloak are the considerations of labor, of the environment, um, and of the intent of this new introduction into our built world and its symbolic resonance. And so what architects do really well is try to make those decisions more visible, right? To make visible the invisible, but by sort of advocating for a faster, more quickly built built environment, mm -hmm. uh, we lose the potential to reveal all of the decisions that go into a well-built, socially just, environmentally just infrastructure. And what is useful about architecture, I would say as a discipline of the, of the arts, to do this is that it, it is very slow, right? The time horizon of, of a building is long. It takes at least three years, if not five, to go from design to completion. And so mm -hmm. the decisions, the impact, the, the idea that we first had of addressing whatever condition it might be is a different condition when the building is complete. And so one must always think in the future. And so that time horizon also allows us the ability to slow down and to understand being very deliberate about our decisions. And I think in our architectural 
work, we are advocating for all architects to really remind themselves about the, that kind of deliberation, about the labor that they hire, about the artisans that they're working with, about the environmental impact of the work that they're doing. And once you start to ask that question, you realize that there is no way that architecture can be removed from its political and social implications. There is just no possible world where it is apolitical. I can't imagine that. And if it is not apolitical, then we are complicit in so many of these injustices and we have to address them. Well, it might be a good time to open up for questions, although we have more images too. Oh, yeah, yeah. Fun, yeah. This is good. Yeah. We have about 15 minutes, right, to, to do that? Okay. Um, oh, yeah. I think we had an image, a question in the back there. I don't know if you can talk about the room. Okay. Hi, this is from Michael. I noticed with interest that your firm is nonprofit. I was making the assumption that's very rare as far mm -hmm. as architectural firms. And do you think that that, uh, I'd be curious as to how that works structurally and does that, mm -hmm. does the nonprofit structure of the firm potentially help with the, the process that, you know, with your kind of mission and perhaps also being able to take the, the slower road to really take into uh, account all the wonderful things that you were talking about. If we want what your firm does to spread more throughout this country, do you think a nonprofit uh, structure is an important part of getting that done? Thanks, thanks for that question. Well, when I, when I tell other architects that we're a nonprofit, they often say, oh, so are we. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah we're, it's not a well-paid discipline, okay? So, uh, but I think the, the point that you brought up is that, uh, you know, for us, uh, it's both an asset and it hinders us as well. But if you think about it outside of just the mission alone, it's a structural path in our mind, right? That there are things that the architectural fee does not pay for. And a lot of that work that it doesn't pay for is the crucial work that's needed to engage deep in communities, to bring the designers early on upstream into the process, to try to ask these hard questions of, of structural violence and structural change, to be immersed in questions of slowing down the process. And um, when, when we can, I think, expand the role of the architect further, um, we add value to our built world and we, in, we bring them into decisions of social justice more directly, right? Instead of being only commodified at the end stage when many of the decisions about what's going to be built have already been decided. So by being a nonprofit, it doesn't mean we can't get commissions, it doesn't mean we uh, don't generate revenue, but we only do projects that are mission aligned and we also raise capital in order to do projects for organizations that can't pay for those services, so nonprofits, um, community groups that need the kind of crucial work of designers to kind of build and develop their vision so that they can then go out and actually construct it. So for us, it's a structural path, right? It's trying to solve um, a void in the marketplace by introducing a firm model that can, um, let's say, intervene at the crucial point where it's necessary to make hard decisions about uh, these questions of environmental and social justice. both of you, um, in terms of the, pow the emotional power of images, mm -hmm. and it's been said that with the Civil War was the first time that there was photography and that people could really see the horrors of war. Yeah. And then this, of course, was said again about what's going on now in Syria and that the photos, for example, there was a lot of discussion about uh, one specific photo on the front page of the New York Times of a little boy tortured. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering if this, you know, talking about the political importance of art, architecture, and images, mm -hmm. whether you have felt that these kinds of images now are bringing out the same political, um, the political, you know, responsiveness of mm -hmm. our country and society against this kind of inhumanity. Right. Yeah. So, well, thank you for the question. And, and it is true, that's the time, the time period in which we were first able to kind of visualize the world through, at a time of war is the Civil War, but really the Crimean War right, right before. So you have this sort of globalized um, moment in which pictures serve this, this new function. Um, you know, I was alluding to this earlier. I, 
uh, when I mentioned Susan Sontag and this question about paralysis, and, um, and I've actually I've talked about this with one of my, uh, uh, someone who just inspires me a great deal, um, Elizabeth Alexander, who, who here today, thinking through this question about whether or not, I, in my mind's eye I have a question about whether or not there's a bystander effect that we are experiencing in the face of image saturation in the context of violence. The bystander effect is a psychological term, right, that um, came to us in the 1960s when the Katie Genovese case in Kew Gardens, Queens um, emerged as a, uh, a moment to examine the function of a crowd in a moment of crisis. And the murder of Katie Genovese went unreported for a great deal longer than we would have thought um, because effectively so many people saw it that everyone thought someone else was doing something and no one did anything. Is there a visual bystander effect today? When you see an image come to you through Twitter or social media of other kinds or the newspaper, do you perhaps um, fall short of the potential uh, physical outrage that might have, say, in the 1960s motivated you to join a march or to go somewhere and instead say to yourself, well, so many are seeing this now that someone else must be doing something. Uh, remember, of course, and this is the kind of taxonomy I have in my mind, there, there are certain kinds of images that have catalyzed uh, our great leaders right, to productive moments, Rosa Parks being uh, politicized in part by the image of Emmett Till's open casket ceremony, or James Baldwin being inspired to come back from Paris because he sees the, the, the horrors of the instances of segregation and violence being perpetrated against those who are integrating public schools. I do believe in the efficacy of photographs, and I believe that images work and that they let us get to work. It's why I honor our artists, our photographers, our poets, our artists of all kinds. I don't believe that you can move past the technology of how images move us, how culture moves us. I think the question is finding works that can more incisively cut through the noise. So this is perhaps me you know, wanting to believe that Douglas is right and that it's productive to engage with a, a thinker like a Susan Sontag who believes that there might be an exhaustion you know, to do with image saturation, but I, I don't believe that's the case, and I think we're in the room because we have a sense that it's not either. I'm an optimist. First of all, I think that the bystander effect is fascinating because I never really had the words for that mm. idea of images. Mm. And also, I wanted to ask you particularly, Sarah, what is your favorite or what do you perceive as the most impactful of the historical politically charged images that you've seen? Yeah. That's a great question. Well, thank you. Um, it's very hard to choose one. What I've tried to do today is to give you a selection of images that I, I would elect as some of the most impactful. Oh. I think we're, we've landed on one of them. This is an image of um, Mamie Till, who's here deliberately decided to permit the open casket ceremony of her son, Emmett Till, to be photographed. We chose this image to show today because of the instrumental use of the photograph of her son, right, that this image shows us on the casket to remind us, and one of the things we haven't really touched on is the function of images to produce counter-narratives that go against stereotypes, right? And here the images function to produce a counter-narrative, to show us the uprightness of her son, to, to make us question how this could have happened to him. I think this image is, is impactful for um, for the reasons she anticipated, I think she knew what this image could do for the civic body. This, um, when, I, when I teach a unit on lynching and focus on Emmett Till, it's one of the hardest days I have. And in fact, to give you a sense of our, our camaraderie, I think when I, I first taught this material at Harvard, I, I, the day before, I called, the two days before, called, called Michael, I was like, no, I would really love it if you could just come to the classroom and just be there. Because it's, it's difficult. That was a day in which we had to end early because the images are so are potent still. There's a contemporary resonance, you know, today. Um, 
So I, I might elect this. I, what we've gone through, as I say, images that I find equally impactful to me. The, the iconicity of the Gordon Parks American Gothic, I think, is still there. Even in coming here today, I, I had students write to me, having watched, you didn't see Kendrick Lamar's new video that references all the Gordon Parks images, saying, oh, Professor Lewis, we spotted all the Gordon Parks images in Kendrick Lamar. You know, the, and that, that shows, I think, the, the endurance of critical literacy and the power of Gordon Parks' work. Um, so I, I could go on and, and on, but, but again, I think you know, the person who understood this long before we all did is Frederick Douglass, and so I'm, I'm grateful that the image of him still constitutes a very potent image for us to meditate upon. I'm curious about resistance mm -hmm. um, to historical venues and structures. And, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Curious about the process of you know, location and how certain buildings are you know, mm -hmm. placed in certain areas because sometimes as the world around the structure develops, sometimes it, it creates an inaccessibility to multiple you know, different people either through gentrification or certain things like that, gerrymandering, stuff like that. The, yeah. uh, I'm wondering what, how people as citizens uh, or how can we influence you know, congressmen or mayors or whoever mm -hmm. can uh, allow these certain spaces to have a very neutral placement mm -hmm. uh, in space. Because you mentioned like in, uh, down south in Alabama, I believe, and how like people don't really walk around in certain areas. So that that shows like sort of inaccessibility. So I'm like, how how can uh, that be changed? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, thank you for that question. Um, you know, I, I go I go back to um, Sarah's point about building visual literacy because I I too think uh, we need to develop design literacy. We need to understand uh, and reveal why the decisions were made that, that building and that design and that infrastructure are where they are. Right? And it's very hard for anybody, be them trained in the built environment or not, to walk around a city and walk around a place and to sort of be pulled into the decision from which created the very space in which you're making, just the zoning laws, the, from you know, redlining to uh, where federal highways were placed. And it was walking around Montgomery where this became even more and more evident to me. I mean, there was this empty neighborhood, basically, of this incredible, uh, incredible place where there's all of these staircases that go to empty lots, which suggests this kind of ghosted um, neighborhood which had fallen into disrepair. And it was just enough, it was like the punctum to say, why is it that there are all these brick staircases up to this hill, there's nothing there? And, um, and then, when I looked at the map, I also saw that all these roads ended at dead ends that surrounded, dead ends into a major highway. Uh, the, the, two, uh, the two interstates are kind of pinned at that moment in Montgomery and kind of framed downtown Montgomery. And because I've been sort of trained in thinking about this built environment of urban planning, I could immediately recognize that this was all because of a federal highway that went in clearly in the, mid, I mean, clearly in the late 50s or 60s. And then the question is why? Like why was it placed where it was? And of course, as soon as you look into the literature, it was placed there because this was the middle class black neighborhood, right? This was the place where Ralph Abernathy's house was, where King had his house when he was in Montgomery. And um, they weaponized the federal highway to go directly through the um, commercial district of the African American neighborhood. And there were uh, protests, there were letters written to Kennedy, um, but they still got a pass. And why, you know, for all sorts of reasons. But one reason was that Alabama State Highway Commissioner was a grand dragon of a KKK. Right? So you're kind of like, all you have to do is sort of peel apart. Why is that dead end there? Oh, the dead end is there because the road used to carry through. And why is that? Oh, because there's a highway here and there's an in, you know, interchange in there. And who lived here before? And then what's left? Oh, there's this empty city, uh, downtown district where nobody is walking around. And like all of that is just underneath the soil. Right? And for us to kind of just take apart and peel back the topsoil and start to reveal those layers, which is our responsibility as those in the urban sphere to, sphere, excuse me, it's the Albert sphere, to so like, uh, to, uh, to start to reveal those. And, and it goes back to Sarah's point, like 
If we don't reveal them, then we're also participating in cloaking them. Right? We're also participating in hiding them. And you know, this image here, and I didn't actually know this at the but this is Bree Newsom taking down a Confederate flag in, in Charleston um, after the uh, after the killing, the, the Emanuel Nine massacre, and um, he pointed out a really interesting part about this image, which is the pediment of the Capitol is empty. Why is the pediment empty? Pediments aren't often empty, right? They usually have sculpture. So you had a name. Yeah, well, a lot of few things, and I let him hold the to conclude, so I'll, I'll wrap. And this is an image I, I use in the classroom. It's and the pediment is empty here. It wasn't meant to be. Um, because of the inability to uh, represent the African-American laborers that they wanted to present on the pediment in 1855, um, in a way that still indicated their rank in society, marble noblizes everybody, right? And the, the proposal was to, was really to emblazon on their uh, slaves, but in marble, and it was not approved. And there's been nothing that's replaced it since. It, it stands empty and, and vacant. So you know, representational justice, I think, is really what we've been talking about today. We would look at the historical roots of why it's so Im important. Um, your question, though, makes me think back to, over the last year, I think one of the most meaningful exchanges um, that really ignited a lot of the work that I do and has brought me here with Michael today. And, it, and it has to do with spaces. Um, you know, it's a real honor to be asked by, um, by Darren Walker, our president of the Ford Foundation, to speak with him, to interview him effectively about the role of art for justice at the Rothko Chapel. As we were speaking, I, in every sort of sense of the word, I felt how rare it was to be in a space that is meant for this kind of gathering of uplift that is somehow neutral in that way, and is designed, of course, with the social justice mission right, that's embedded there. A space like this allows us to replicate that kind of sense. But yes, the built environment, the places in which we have this conversation outside of our beloved social media is crucial. Right? And I want to thank Damien again for allowing us to come together to do this kind of work uh, today. So thank you. Thank you.